Hi, good evening. I'm Lonnie Stonich, the Executive Director of FAN, and I'm honored to welcome you to a fascinating conversation this evening between Dr. Lisa Miller and Professor Stephen Rockefeller. Thank you for attending. FAN is a nonprofit organization that presents a high quality speaker series offered free to the public on a wide variety of topics, including human development, mental health, education, and social justice, among others. We have over 150 videos of past events archived on our website and YouTube channel, so please be sure to explore. And now for introductions. Lisa Miller is the New York Times bestselling author of The Spiritual Child and the new book, The Awakened Brain. And she is a professor in the clinical psychology program at Teachers College at Columbia University. She is the founder and director of the Spirituality Mind Body Institute, the first Ivy League graduate program and research institute in spirituality and psychology. And she has held over a decade of joint appointments in the Department of Psychiatry at Columbia University Medical School. She is the editor of the Oxford University Press Handbook of Psychology and Spirituality, founding co-editor-in-chief of the APA journal Spirituality in Clinical Practice, an elected fellow of the American Psychological Association, and the two-time president of the APA Society for Psychology and Spirituality. A graduate of Yale and the University of Pennsylvania, where she earned her doctorate under the founder of positive psychology, Marty Seligman, Dr. Miller has served as principal investigator on multiple grant funded research studies. Stephen Rockefeller is a professor emeritus of religion at Middlebury College, where he also served as Dean of the college. He received his Master of Divinity degree from Union Theological Seminary in New York City and his PhD from Columbia University. He is the author of John Dewey, Religious Faith and Democratic Humanism, and the co-editor of two books of essays, The Christ and the Bodhisattva, and Spirit and Nature, Why the Environment is a Religious Issue. Over the past 25 years, Professor Rockefeller has played a leading role in the drafting and promotion of the Earth Charter, which is a declaration of global interdependence with fundamental principles for building a just, sustainable, and peaceful world. It's now my pleasure to welcome Dr. Lisa Miller and Professor Stephen Rockefeller. Thank you, Lonnie, very much. And I, I want to start by saying that it's just a great honor to be here with Dr. Lisa Miller and for us to be participating in FAN's wonderful program of public lectures and dialogues. America today is a deeply divided and troubled nation. Our nation's experiment in freedom and democracy is being severely tested. There is much suffering among us in our land. These are perilous times. They are also times that provide opportunity for learning, growth, healing, and trans transformation. However, if we're going to find our way forward, we're going to have to go deeper. Dr. Miller has written a book, The Awakened Brain, that will help us do just that. And as we get started before our conversation, Dr. Miller would like to lead us in a brief spiritual practice. Lisa. Thank you, Dr. Rockefeller. I'm so delighted to be here together with fellow parents, women, men, grandparents. This is, this is exactly um, where I would hope to see the science of the past 20 years land. And to be in discussion with you, Stephen, is a tremendous honor. Stephen has been an inspiration, a dear friend, a colleague, a collaborator, a mentor. So to share our conversation tonight is really um, a moment of great meaning, and I'm so appreciative to you, Stephen. Um, the practice I'm going to share with you is a taste of using your awakened brain. It's a brief 90 second practice, and it opens up in all of us here now a felt understanding of that of which we will speak for the next hour. So rather than explain about the awakened brain, I'd like to give you a chance to enter into your own natural capacity for awakening. It's a 90 second practice, as always an invitation, if it should feel right to you. And before I share any practice, I thank 
the person who taught me this practice, who was Dr. Gary Weaver um, about 10 years ago. Okay, so I'm going to invite you to take five breaths, open up your inner space. I invite you to set before you a table. This is your table. And to your table, you may invite anyone, living or deceased, who truly has your best interest in mind. Anybody, living or deceased, who truly has your best interest in mind. And with them all sitting there, ask them if they love you. And now to your table, you may invite your higher self, the part of you that's much more than anything you've done or not done or have or don't have, your true eternal higher self. and ask you if you love you. And now finally, you may invite your higher power, whatever word you may use, however you may know your higher power. And ask your higher power if they love you. And now with all of those people sitting here right now, what do they need to let you know? What do they need to share to tell you now? And when you're ready, I invite you back. This is your counsel. They are always there for you. Who shows up may change depending on where you are in your road of life and what you may choose to ask them may be determined by what's on your heart at that time. But they are always there. And our capacity to receive the wisdom, the direction, what you need to know right now is a question of awakening to the presence. This is a seat of transcendent perception. This is a hardwired neural docking station of awareness, like catching a ball in a mitt. And it is a form of human perception, expanded perception of which we are all capable. Science shows us on day one every baby is born with this capacity. And by the time that we are adults, it is one third innate, two thirds environmentally formed. So how we parent and how we teach and how we treat each other's children is of enormous impact onto its formation. This is your awakened awareness. That is the awakened brain of which we are about to speak. And now you have in your own direct experience, a sense of your own awakened brain. Stephen, thank you for allowing us to share that. Lisa, thank you so much. Uh, here, here's my, my first question. Over the last two centuries, the ongoing conflict between science and religion has generated widespread confusion and skepticism about religion and spirituality, and also, among some people, doubts about science. However, in your life and work, science and spirituality have been intertwined in a very positive way. What experiences in your early life and education inspired you to become a clinical psychologist and led you to focus on your scientific research on spirituality? See, you know, when I was starting out as an intern on a, the inpatient unit of a psychiatric hospital, that was pre-data, right? Pre-computers. So there were tangible manila folders that carried people's cases. 
And sometimes someone would come into the hospital and they'd stay there maybe four days on the inpatient unit and they'd have a thin file. But more often than not, what I saw was that the very same patients came back for a second round and a third round. It even had a name, the revolving door syndrome. And the mental health treatment as it was at the time simply was not helping them get better. And I share in the awakened brain ways in which in some cases it made them far worse. And yet all the while that people were struggling with such grief or such despair or such isolation, increasingly, I kept getting little taps on my shoulder. You know, Dr. Miller, Dr. Miller, could you come here with me? And they would take me back you know, behind a door, sometimes into the kitchen, in one case, into the pantry of the kitchen to be away from the mainstream treatment space. And there they'd say, you know, Dr. Miller, I'm being sent upstate, which is when you're not being helped and you're not being cured, you're just kind of sent away. I'm being sent upstate tomorrow. And by the pots and pans in this tiny little corner, will you pray with me? And there was only clearly, I mean, we didn't happen to be of the same faith tradition, but there was clearly one answer. Someone in their deepest moment of despair was turning to God, was turning to their understanding of the transcendent, of the sacred relationship. And they said, will you join me here? And that happened time and time again. As I saw, I share this in the awakened brain, a, a young girl came in once 13 years old, all by herself to the hospital, which almost never is the case. Normally there's a parent or a grandparent. And when I invited her in, she told me, I brought myself, my father, who was her son, her moon, her stars. My father was running his deli, you know, on 180th Street and Broadway. And two men who he knew came in, robbed him and, and shot him. He was killed. And this little girl's life ended as she knew it. And there was no amount of cognitive therapy and no amount of interpersonal therapy that was filling that donut-sized hole in her heart. And even if she could renegotiate relationships and think better thoughts and replace bad thoughts with good thoughts, she longed for her father. And this went on, you know, from one to 10, she went from maybe a two to a four to a three, never above a five for months. Until one day she came skipping in. Dr. Miller, I've got to tell you, Dr. Miller, yes, sit down. You're not going to believe this. My grandmother allowed me to go to a party with my cousin as long as I was chaperoned by my cousin's boyfriend and his brother. And there with her chaperones, I met the most wonderful boy. He was so polite. He was so kind. And we must have spoke for 20 minutes. And here's the best part. Guess what his name was? It was Horatio, the very same name as her father, a quite unusual name in her community. And she said, don't you see? I said, tell me. My father sent him. My father is looking out after me. And when she felt the presence of her father, our ancestors by our side, she went from a one, two, four, one, two, all the way to a nine. She rejoined the world of the living and she had harder days and better days, but she knew that her father walked with her. To ignore the transcendent awareness, to ignore, ignore awakened awareness is to cut us off at our knees. If I had followed protocol as usual and nodded, what does that mean to you? Oh, it's a diversity variable. That would have completely deactivated the treatment. That would have taken away her deepest form of knowing. This mental health minus spirituality made no sense to me. It made no sense in the patients I saw and it made no sense in my own life. Um, I share in the awakened brain a very long battle all the while that I was a scientist and a, and a clinician with depression myself. Um, my husband and I were trying to conceive and you know, I was healthy. I was 30, he was 31. We all checked out well. So we tried, if you will, for a few months and nobody came and feeling somewhat disappointed. We did what we thought would be the next step, which was we went to the Caribbean and thought, well, then we'll have a family and still nobody came. And after ratcheting this up to doctors and increasingly, um, more involved procedures, still nobody came. So much so that as a researcher, I got on the computer and I found the very best team in the country who invented in vitro using sea urchins at Woods Hole. And still we did not conceive. Every time we were not pregnant, it felt like I was going to a funeral, a funeral of the baby that wasn't, a funeral of what parents we weren't. 
Um, and it was so despairing that there were times where I literally found my husband lying on the floor at night. He was so depressed. And yet in the depth, when we really, if you will, hit the bedrock of despair, we started, people started showing up, helpers and healers to help us along our way. Um, you know, a guy on the bus sat down next to me and said, you're just that type of woman. You, you seem so nice. I bet you're going to go all around the world adopting children. Or my mother would call and say, our neighbor just adopted the most beautiful little boy, David. Just wanted you to know. Um, and we started getting the picture that there was a child out there for us. And um, it goes into really quite meaningful and, and mystical experiences that I share in the awakened brain. But in the end, I'll, well, maybe I shouldn't tell the end, but the point is that the breakdown of depression was not one of thinking badly of myself and replacing those thoughts as cognitive therapy might hold or of learning to speak to people differently as interpersonal therapy might hold, but it was the gradual breakdown of thinking that life is something that I could control with enough strategy and planning and preparation and smarts, I could make it go my way, A plus B plus C, to realizing that the biggest things in life, and we've certainly seen it in the past 18 months, are not controlled. And when command control, what I call achieving awareness, simply does not square with the deeper dynamism of life, we may at first be depressed, not getting what I wanted, but it's actually an opportunity to shift 40 degrees, 100 degrees, and see the bright open yellow door. The red door stuck, but the yellow door is open. And the yellow door could have someone or some journey or some way of being that I didn't even know existed. And I only found because just as it was necessary that the red door be stuck and the yellow door be opened, it was necessary that I learned to shift from controlling life to being in deep dialogue with life. What is life showing me now? What is the deeper relationship with, I would say God, spirit, force in and through all life. Is there not a guidance in life? through which we are a discoverer of our path, far greater and more magnificent than a command control maker of our path. Thank you, Lisa. And let, let, <clears throat> let, let's talk about your research. Some commentators, knowledgeable people have called it path-breaking and revolutionary. So tell us what your approach has been, what's particularly significant, and what are some of your most important findings? In short, how did you discover the awakened brain, and what is it? So Stephen, thank you for those very encouraging, kind words. Um, my lab was quick out of the blocks around you know, 1997, and fellow labs have joined us so that we now have a very robust field bringing the scientific lens onto the impact of spirituality in the human life. Mm -hmm. And what have we seen? Well, in aggregate, it's, it's quite extraordinary. It's something every parent, I think, intuits and may find powerful and helpful to see mirrored in the lens of science. Perhaps the most important finding is that every single one of us is innately a spiritual being. We are born with this capacity. Temperament is about half hardwired, half environmentally formed. If you think of a colicky baby who then is soothed, the capacity through which we perceive the transcendent relationship is one third and eight, two thirds socialized, shaped by our parents, our grandparents, our faith community, our school community, by omission and commission. The clock of formation always runs. So as parents, as teachers, um, as members of the community, we constantly exert a great impact on the formation of natural spirituality in the children among us, in the teens among us. We can track in the brain where this seat of perception is. And it turns out that the very same regions that when used grow thick and strong as marked by a thick cortex in the parietal, occipital and precuneus, regions of perception, reflection and orientation. They are not thick, but thin in people who don't build the muscle. So we are architects of our brain in a sense, we are architects of this docking station of transcendent awareness. When it is built, when the muscle if you will, is built, we see that an adolescent is 80% less likely to become addicted to drugs and alcohol. More precisely, a standard deviation above as compared to below the mean and a tendency to say, I turn to God for guidance in times of difficulty, or 
I feel there's a great sanctity in nature or my family is a spiritual home to me. Walking on spiritual bedrock within or without of a faith tradition, we are all spiritual. And when that muscle's built, that teen is 80% less likely to be addicted, 60% at decreased risk for major depression, the deep pothole that can derail us. And in this era of tragic suicide, a teen is more likely to, buy, to die by suicide than by auto accident for the first time in history. A teen is 82% at decreased risk for completed suicide, four-fifths less likely to take their life when they have a strong spirituality that is shared. And there we get to the seat of, of all the dimensions of lived spiritual life of greatest importance is a seat of transcendent awareness and awakened brain and that it might be shared in community, fellowship, sangha, the minion, but where we see each other as God's children, as souls on earth, as worthy of ultimate worthiness, knowing each other in that ultimate way, treating each other in that way. These two dimensions are game changing for all else in our life. Lisa, tell us a little about your work with the MRI um, technology and the discovery you made about depression and the brain and awakening. So Stephen, thank you, because I think that's very relevant to our moment now. Um, it turns out that if you look at a teen who reaches age 26, and at 26 says, yes, my personal spirituality is highly important to me. That teen is two and a half times more likely to have gotten to that state of awareness, spiritual awareness, if in the past 10 years behind them, they struggled with despair, if there were patches of deep confusion and pain. Depression, struggle, despair, these are invitations to a deepening of our awareness. When the world as I know it doesn't hold, when I'm not at home, when I feel this emptiness, this hardwired booting up of spirituality with puberty can feel like a half empty glass, existential emptiness. The long silences, praying, being amongst others in service, spiritual action opens up the perception of the teen so that he or she is more able to see into the deeper nature of life and start to perceive and feel the deeper truth in life. Depression, despair, this is an invitation to spiritual awakening. And in the brain, we see a thicker cortex in the regions of perception, mm -hmm otherwise would be thin and that thinness is same in those very same regions in people with recurrent major depression offering evidence that sustained spiritual life is neuroprotective against recurrent depression and what's most remarkable Stephen is that this tendency to grow a thick strong spiritual brain a stronger receptive brain is even greater in people who are otherwise at high risk. They're at high risk because their parents were depressed. They're at high risk because they grew up under a rain cloud of depression. Where there's risk, there's even greater benefit of strong personal mm -hmm. spiritual life, protecting and growing the brain to gird them against subsequent depressions. And not only that, it augments the field of perception so that life is full of yellow doors. There's more surprises and life is more magnificent than I might've planned just banging on the red door because my desire to get through that red door, it's based on everything from today back. It is based on historical data, but where in being with dialogue, in dialogue with the spirit of life, that yellow door takes me, I can't even envision, but it's very often far more right than what I might've historically fathomed to be the case. And when you make this uh, distinction between the achieving brain and the awakened brain, you're really talking in part here about different ways of knowing. And I think you emphasize in the, in the, in the awakened brain, there are multiple ways of knowing. And if we restrict ourselves to the achieving brain, we have a very narrow view of the world where everything is more or less reduced to its utilitarian value. And then you run into a very deep ethical problem. So would it be right, Lisa, to think that the achieving brain 
needs to balance. I mean, the, the, the awakened brain needs to balance that achieving brain with the spiritual moral awareness. That's so beautifully put, Stephen. And I might say that, you know, at the table of human knowing, we have the logician and the empiricist from the achieving brain. And mm -hmm. also at the table is the intuitive and the mystic, right? Mm -hmm. From the awakened brain. And mm -hmm. when we connect all forms of human knowing, in the MRI, we actually see the road is paved, myelinated tracks between regions of the brain, which mm -hmm. is known as the good brain, a more innovative, a more creative, a more adaptive brain. What in some of my work is called more situationally aware, more able to move mm -hmm. in tandem with the tidal waves of what is life showing me now. Where it comes to relationality, I think in too many places, in schools, even in our homes, at dinner parties, we are stuck in transactional relationships of the achieving brain. And I sit down at a dinner party and someone wants to know where I live and what I do. And I can literally hear the calculator and where do I place, what do I add up to? Well, another way to sit down next to someone is with deep interest for what is, what is their journey? What is their path in life? Who are they really? most deeply. Um, we need more and more to choose, put our hand on the gear shift and choose to move out of transactional relationships and with the very same people shift our stance into transformational relationships. Mm -hmm. And in a transformational relationship, we take deep interest, we know each other beyond the bio body suit to the heart, to the soul, the sparkle in the eyes. And we are accompanying one another as guides, what I actually call trail angels on the path of life. We show up for each other. And when I hear you, you know, talking about the achieving brain and the awakened brain, it reminds me of Martin Buber's distinction between I-thou relationships and I-it relationships, or Eric Fromm's distinction between being and having. And, and would, would you agree that the natural spirituality that you're talking about is really about a way of being as opposed to uh, uh, having and, and becoming more, being more as opposed to having more. And in being more, as you say so powerfully, life feels augmented. Life has more pixels. It feels abundant and full. And who we are to one another can be breathtaking. You know, instead of wondering, you know, you got the 86 and I got the 74, or I, I got the 74, you got a 96. And that goes out of the classroom to, the next phase of life and you know you got promoted and i didn't or you have two bedrooms and i have three but you know, this constant transactional assessment turns us into two dimensions mm -hmm. and if we open up what you're describing so beautifully the depth of our being and connect with one another in the depth of here this moment spirit in and through us being yes. then relationships are their their spiritual events and yeah. their grand adventures. And this you know, has, the clock is ticking oh, here. Okay. We yeah, want sure. to turn our attention to the way in which a number of leaders and institutions, having read your research, have turned to you for guidance in helping them deal with the crisis we're passing through as a nation. Um, and, and for example, the United States Army has contacted you and, and asked you um, to serve with them as a consultant. So I'd like to ask you, why has the Army sent you on a unique mission, really, to work with commanders, chaplains, and non-commissioned officers at military bases across the United States, including Alaska and Hawaii, and, and I think you're even being sent overseas now. So how are you supporting the Army? What, what are you doing for them? So why did this happen? Yes. So about two years ago, a um, general and a colonel showed up at my door at Columbia, and it started what has been a most meaningful collaboration, a profound collaboration. If we look at the past 20 years of science on spirituality, its enormous protective benefits against psychopathology in young adults, its enormous role in not just resilience, but renewal following trauma how profound spirituality is in supporting and actually is the explanatory factor behind the character strengths and virtues, optimism, grit, persistence. The spiritual core is the most important superordinate from which all other lines of development follow. The map of science is clear. The army is data-driven. The army is extraordinarily innovative. 
they had read the spiritual child, they had looked at some of the science, they had seen indeed there is a blueprint of science on human flourishing, human recovery, and even fitness and performance. So together, um, I met with the four stars and the vice chief, the chief and the secretary of the army. They said, yes, this science describes what we're seeing because of course the army receives a slice of America. It's a slice of American pie. The army has in concentration, the very same challenges that our country has writ large. Fragility in young people, elevated epidemic rates of suicide, depression, anxiety, and addiction, questionable relational ethics to include racism and extremism and sexual assault and sexism. This is not the army's problem. This is our American challenge. And in every generation we've risen to this challenge. What we have within us, of course, is the resource, our innate awakened awareness is ready to be brought forward. Our seat of spiritual awareness is there ready to be built. The army decided that we are going to use this roadmap of science within every band of professional execution, whether it's a drill sergeant or a commanding general, behavioral health, no matter who it is, their range of expertise and their impact is going to be augmented when they are trained into this body of knowledge. So rather than handing a program where you check the boxes, we've gone around to Fort Bragg, to Fort Hood, to Fort Jackson, and the Army is integrating the map of science. The Army is taking what we know about spiritual development and spiritual fortitude and saying, just as we have physical fitness for the physical core, so too we need spiritual fitness for the mm. spiritual core. I'll give you two examples. Now in basic training, FM 722, Field Marshal's Manual 722-10, says that a soldier must be fit physically, mentally, and spiritually. Mm. Now this is silent on religion, this is spirituality. Another integrative point in behavioral health, those who provide the psychologists, the psychiatrists, the social workers often become depleted. There's now a universal spiritual resource, a chaplain embedded in behavioral health so that the providers can have more spiritual support and turn to the patients as well as refer patients, a dual referral, like a layer cake, help from behavioral health, mm -hmm. help from a chaplain so that the spiritual core is nourished. In each person's zone of professional expertise, they are now equipped and educated and empowered to engage the whole soldier. The same model is being brought to private sector businesses, is being brought to schools. We can make institutional transformation in the culture and climate. It's not a manual or a program or a curriculum that lands on the desk. It's reinvigorating what Stephen, you called a way of being, our natural spirituality, so that we see each other as foundationally beings of inherent worth, as we treat each other transformationally, not transactionally, and the Army's really led the way on this, but it is readily replicated in other organizations. So Lisa, tell us now about your vision for the schools. When you wrote The Spiritual Child, you were particularly focused on the need for spirituality and education. So share with us your vision about spirituality and education and describe what you're doing now to try to promote this transformation of school culture. Well, Stephen, you have been an extraordinary close collaborator in this work together. You and Frank Peabody and I have worked, I think it's now been four years, mm. four years. Um, and the declaration which you wrote is, is profound. Um, I wanna circle back to your opening remarks, which is we do have unprecedented challenges in the relational fabric of our culture. And as you as really one of the world's leading experts on Dewey have pointed out, Dewey, in fact, I, I almost, would you like to say a few words about Dewey and what it takes to run a democracy? I'd like you to say it. Well, the, the, the major point that Dewey would make is that democracy is first and foremost, a great moral ideal and a personal way of individual life. And this is something he argued the whole 70 years of his professional career, and he was passionate about it. And, and Dewey believed that if you're going to have a healthy political democracy, 
you need moral and spiritual democracy as the foundation. And, and what strikes me about your work is your notion of natural spirituality and relation as a relational spirituality is just what Dewey was talking about when he talks about moral and spiritual democracy. And I think this is something we really need to take seriously with our young people, that democracy is not just a system of government, it's not just a political system, and that the foundation is you need a moral and spiritual foundation. And the very principle of equality, if you really understand it, it's the impl imp implementation of the golden rule. It, it, the, the meaning of equality is we are all equal in dignity and rights. And if we're all equal in dignity and rights, then I should treat you as I'd like to be treated. And, and, and that's the underlying inspiration for that principle as it evolved and developed over 3000 years in Western culture. Now, forgive me, I've gone on too long here, but, but I, I, I think there is that connection. <clears throat> and, and what Dewey would like to have seen our schools do is just what you're doing now, which is to create a democratic culture in the school that nurtures democratic ideals and values, which begin with respect for the equal dignity and rights of each and every person. And Stephen, in our conversations over the past four years, you've put, shared so beautifully how in a spiritual or moral democracy, there's a deep sense of bond and common being. So even when we disagree, mm. and in fact, even when we disagree quite a bit, there's still a felt common being. There's yeah. still a sense of common care and love for our country. So this is a moral and spiritual democracy, which is essentially a strong fabric mm. of human relationship, of relational spirituality. The school, as you've shared so beautifully, is effectively a, a, a living laboratory, a petri dish of where we learn to be democratic citizens, where mm. we learn civil society. And that is um, foundational to our country. And it, Right now, I have seen schools that succeed in building spiritual and moral democracy. In our three-year study, we found dozens of schools around our country. The moment you walk in the lobby, you know you're there, where their first agenda, it's often even in the mission statement, is to support relational spirituality, to support the spiritual core. <laughs> and then everything else follows from there. So. Um, I want to make one point of clarification because people might be wondering around this time, you know, are they talking about religion or are they talking about spirituality? I might invite everyone to envision an overlapping Venn diagram, two circles, and where they intersect, religion, spirituality, about 70% of, of people in the United States say I am spiritual and I am religious, whether I am Hindu, Jewish, Muslim, Catholic, whatever my faith tradition may be, my spiritual experience, my transcendent experience, and that I see it in you as God's child is held in my faith tradition. 30% of millennials and fewer with each older generation say I am spiritual, but I am not religious. I experience spirituality in community, in art, in music, in nature. Whether or not someone is religious, we all are innately spiritual beings. It is a human capacity, just like we are born physical and emotional and cognitive beings, so too, so too we are born spiritual beings. Mm -hmm. Now, you, we wouldn't dream of not allowing a child school lunch or PE, air and sunshine, to nourish their body. Well, so too we have to nourish innate spirituality or else left to lay fallow, it can atrophy, or particularly when there's a surge in adolescence, it's marked by longitudinal twin studies, there's a biological clock in adolescence teens go shopping, they will find untrue teachers and untrue spiritualities. So it is absolutely essential that we show up as teachers, as educators, as parents, as community for mm -hmm. spiritual growth. It's the clock runs. And if we're not there, it still runs, but it's not supported. Two thirds. So, so Lisa, would you say that, that one of the basic problems with our school system is that the emphasis is really all on the achieving brain as opposed to the awakened brain. And, 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 and this is at the root of a lot of our social problems. 
as even in the air and water of the culture. Right? It's in oh. left willy nilly, the culture is following a very dogged, high octane curriculum. So who we are to one another is, if you walk into a classroom, 90% of what's going on is the people in the room. And yet very often class is taught as if three people could have been absent and class would have been the same. Mm. So the people in the room are the relational field and what happens in the room is what's happening in life. So um, mm. Stephen, I think your point is very important. And most of all, when we went around and we identified spiritually supportive schools, we saw that from the head of school all the way through and vertically integrated, there was a common held vision that we are here today to support the spiritual core of the child, to reintegrate the spiritual child into the whole person rather than disintegrate, which is unhealth. And you've created a, a um, awakened school institute at Teachers College that is now working with teachers and principals in America's public schools. It is remarkable. We discovered that indeed a spiritually supportive pedagogical culture can be taught and deliberately built by any school in a way that's consistent with that school's language and mission and culture. So Please, let, me, let me ask you this, because the time, the clock is ticking, and I think this is a question many people would like you to answer. Most public schools in the U.S. today are reportedly struggling trying to teach reading, writing, and math, and they're also grappling with how to give students a more honest account of slavery, Jim Crow, and systemic racism. Is it a good idea to ask schools to take on a major new challenge like you're recommending for which most principals and teachers have not been trained and are not well prepared? So let me put it this way. Most people go into teaching with a very, very deep calling and it is a spiritual calling. And if we ask teachers, who was the teacher who moved you? They don't talk about the curriculum and they don't talk about reading, writing, and math. They talk about Mrs. Witcher in third grade or Mr. Allen in sixth grade. And what was it about Mr. Allen or Mrs. Witcher? Well, they saw in me more than I even knew was possible for myself. They loved me even when I got a C or a D every bit as much as when I got an A or won the day. So there was a depth and unconditional love in our opening practice, those people at the table who truly had your best interest in mind, that was the stance held by the transformational teachers. And once the relationship is there, the possibility for learning augments exponentially. There is much more learning when you're in a field of love and connection. There is much more knowledge to be imparted when you trust the person who's teaching you and you want to take them in. The idea that it's really an outdated 20th century view that education is somehow administered as if you bought it from a vending machine. You know, no, it, it, is, it is held in the relational field and its meaning is held in the relational field. Math, English, these things are learned in a stance of trust. And when the baby bird has an open mouth, not when they're frightened. Let me ask you another question that I think some parents have on mind. What do you say to a parent who says spirituality is the responsibility of parents and schools shouldn't get into developing and nurturing the spiritual life of children? Right. So Stephen, as you and many people know, about 40 years ago in the good intention to be inclusive, we threw all talk of religion or spirituality out of the public square. And we now have a spiritually non-conversant society. We also have a case in which for the first time there are children in school raised by parents who themselves never had support for the formation of their own spiritual core. So children show up today with their genetic inheritance, their hardwired capacity for spirituality completely unformed. There's no practice of transcendence, whether it's prayer, meditation, walk in nature. There's no language of the transcendent, direct knowing, intuition, mystical knowing. There's no one whose values they've met are derived from the way the world is somehow inherently built, not cherry picked based on expediency or hedonics. So we have never had children showing up with the two thirds formation onto the spiritual core totally empty until now. 
So what I would say to that parent is that I certainly agree a hundred percent that in the public school, religion is the job of the parents, hundred percent, but we're not talking about religion. Religion is 100% socialized. It is environmentally transmitted is indeed the gift of our parents and ancestors. We're talking about a foundational human capacity, a way of being through which we perceive a deep relationship with all life, spirit in and through all life, energy, life force, fellow living beings, one another as inherently worthy. And when this natural seat of awareness and perception is cultivated, your child is 80% less likely to be addicted, 80% less likely to take their life. Yeah. Who wouldn't want that for their child? It's a realization of their inherent being. It's how they are made whole. It's how we were meant to be. And it has been implicitly sucked out of culture when we became a spiritually non-conversant society. We're social beings, we're moral beings, and we're also spiritual beings. And spirituality is essential to individual well-being and social well-being. Yes, yeah, yes, Lisa. This is all fascinating, and and let me just ask you one more question um, about education. Do you do you see an opportunity here for collaboration with the holistic education movement, social emotional learning, the 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 new civics education movement? and so forth, do you, do, you, do you think that there can be collaboration in those areas? I'd say these- groups and movements? Absolutely, I would say these movements are meant to go hand in hand. They are non-redundant. They, they will benefit each other tremendously. Hmm. So the excellent work going on in character education and SEL, right, the excellent facing history in ourselves complements hmm. a deliberately designed school culture, a relational culture that cultivates the deep innate spiritual capacity of the child. That when you have a culture that teaches the child that we are loved, we are held, we are guided, and we are never alone. And we show up for each other to be loving and holding and guiding trial angels and never alone. When they experience the fullness of life and the true nature of the deeper nature of life mm -hmm. and help others do the same, mm -hmm. then you are helping the child realize his or her full potential. Life is more abundant. Their life is more meaningful and purposeful. Love is deeper and truer. Commitment is there. You're helping them realize their life. And that goes hand in hand with learning about commitment and grit. That goes hand in hand in learning about what good character, keeping your word is, playing fairly. The sensibilities, the desires of the heart will drive the head rather than the other way around. And mm -hmm. anything you teach the child will be more deeper set, more enduring. And yes. all of those superb programs will only be augmented in their impact. Yes. And, 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 and your research has demonstrated that empathy is an innate characteristic and can naturally develop to, in the direction of compassion if it's nurtured and developed. But the, 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 the danger is that if these instincts these intuitions, the questions, the yearning of, of young children is dismissed, neglected, not encouraged. The whole spiritual side of their, their personality uh, can go into retreat and, and basically be suppressed. And a society where that happens um, is, is going to pay a great price. And I think this is part of what, what you've been arguing. You know, it's so interesting, Stephen. I think back to bringing my home, my home, my oldest child, Isaiah, who we adopted from an orphanage. And when we visited the orphanage, we saw babies lying on their stomach in a circle with toys in the middle. And as they played every so often, one of the babies in the circle would start to scream and cry. And another baby would just flick a toy <laughs> for that child, yes. caring for that child. Natural yeah. empathy, natural relational connection. Yeah. Well, Isaiah came home you know, to the United States and we took him to the beach um, in the Northeast. And sure enough, he had his one cherished toy. He'd just come home, we didn't have any toys yet, but we'd mm -hmm. rinsed out a cottage cheese container and he thought it was fabulous. He mm -hmm. had a light and lively you know, cottage cheese container on the beach. He met the first little boy he'd met outside the orphanage now that he was in the United States. 
And the first thing the little boy did was snatch it from his hand. <laughs> and Isaiah didn't look sad. He looked absolutely dumbfounded, shocked. He had never seen mine. Right? So yeah. Yeah. we very early on teach about mine. Yes. That's fine. But yeah. Isaiah lived in a world of ours. Yes, yes. So Lisa, just as we're getting toward the end here, um, just reflect a little bit on your sense of what superior leadership involves. I mean, a democracy requires strong institutions, strong institutions require strong leadership. And, and, and if the leadership isn't there, you know, society just can't function well. So say just something as we're, we're wrapping up here about your understanding of spirituality and leadership. Well, I'll go back to the army. And the reason that the army has in only two years managed to transform their culture, a million people in the army, their institutional culture to being spiritually supportive, to be transformational, not only narrowly transactional, mm -hmm. is because the entire transformation through all ranks of the army were authorized by the top. There needs to be a clear statement that driven from the top, yes, we do this here. We invite the whole person in and that includes an awakened voice and awakened awareness. When the top ratifies and says, yes, indeed, this organization includes the voice in the first person of spiritual life and supports relationality that is transformational. Everyone very quickly knows within them, because this is hardwired, it's a quarter inch under the surface, how to start filling out that vision. It really works and it really works quickly. We've seen the same thing with a large financial institution, um, now with a large organization that uh, produces commercial goods. Organizations are where we live 70 to 80% of our time. It's where we get healthy and feel love and connection and home, or it's where we feel isolated, cut off, treated as if we're a commodity, we get sick, we get depressed. Organizational culture is how we live our lives together. Um, mm -hmm. and a leader has everything to say with who we are, what we're doing here today at work, and actually more deeply, who are we to one another? What are we doing here on earth? Mm -hmm. A leader with vision very quickly transforms his or her entire organization by articulating that probably 20 times a day. Yes, yes. And there, there is Lonnie. Okay. Thank you, Lisa. <laughs> Thank you, Stephen, so much for this wonderful conversation. And here I am, and you have some great questions. We're going to uh, go through. It's 7.54, so we have about six minutes for questions. I want to remind everyone that Lisa will be joining after hours. We're, we're working on Professor Rockefeller here to see if he'll maybe join us as well. We're not sure, but Lisa will be there answering questions. Happy to answer more at after hours. You can get access to After Hours by purchasing a copy of The Awakened Brain from our bookseller. We've been putting links in chat. So please do your best. Come join us. It's going to be a lot of fun. Um, so we have a couple questions here, um, more than a couple, but I want to hit on, let's see, let's go with, uh, I'll start with Maureen's question. And she asks, how do we invite others into relational spirituality or spiritual growth who resist spirituality or think it's woo-woo? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So I'll speak first institutionally, and then I'll speak personally. Institutionally, I have always led with science. So we started at Columbia University, the first foundationally spiritual psychology program where spirituality was foundational in how we think and teach and develop. With the army, we led with science. With the private sector organizations, we lead with science. With schools, we lead with science. Science shows us that we are foundationally innate spiritual beings who must develop our capacity to be whole and integrated, to be healthy, to be strong, to be able to love and make commitments. It is foundational to our whole personhood. So I leave with science. On the personal level, um, it's very, very interesting. When you look at the dimensions of lived spiritual life that correlate with the awakened brain, the sort of neural seat of transcendent awareness, of all of the dimensions of, of prayer, of meditation, of all the wonderful ways in, when someone's stuck, what cracks the egg, what is most correlated with engaging the awakened brain? Love of neighbor and surface. And I hear this time and time again, when someone's really stuck, when someone's really depressed, when someone's angry or isolated, if we simply move our feet and do good work, 
good acts of service for one another. We instantiate a sense where we are part of the family of life. We become part of the family of life. And then we start perceiving that we are part of the family of life. And then we start perceiving that we're actually part of the field of life. So it starts with breaking out of atomism, the isolation of me, 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 and giving and caring and seeing others. That is what moves us forward more than anything else. I once interviewed a chaplain of a very well-known independent boarding school. And I said, are your kids spiritual? And he looked at me after years, decades at the school. And he said, no, he said, I wouldn't say that our students see beyond their own desk. And he said, but you know what I do? I take a group down for a service trip and they're digging a well, building a school side by side, the people in the town who will benefit from this well, from the school there starts to be some realization that these students are part of a world of care and love, a bigger world. But it started by walking the walk. Um, to that end, I think maybe uh, folks would like, and there is a question here um, from Lisa, and I think um, if you can give, look at it as a concrete example, just so that it's very clear in people's minds. Can you give a concrete example of what teaching or cultivating relational spirituality looks like? So pretend, you walked into an AP history class or something and yes. teacher kids like what what does it actually look like so especially for those especially in a public school environment where as you can imagine there's certainly um, a great deal of perhaps well-founded reticence about if uh, religion and and the public school system are like getting too intertwined I, I take your points where these things are different what you're talking about is not about religion you've been very careful about separating these two things but maybe if you could give folks a concrete example of what relational spirituality looks like in an actual classroom setting between a teacher and pupils. So together with Stephen, for three years, we conducted a study of the daily life of a spiritually supportive school. What is it in the culture and climate? Good. And these were very diverse schools. I mean, you know, one was a highly resourced independent school and one was a school started in West Philly by the Black Panthers and one was a school in Oakland and one was a boarding school that was land-based out West. So very different schools in terms of culture and climate and mission. But what was common was the DNA of a spiritually supportive relational culture. And all, the collaborative for spirituality and education, which Stephen and I started, has taken these, this DNA and made it available and free and open to any school through our Awakened School Institute. 12 sessions online, two visits, two days in the fall, two days in the spring, through which any school in a way that is true to their culture, their mission, it is the ultimate in cultural inclusivity because it empowers the teachers and the heads in that school to say what for them would be the way to instantiate this DNA. Let me give you, I'll give you three nucleotides on the DNA, okay? One. Oh, you're at, also you're at 7.59, so you got about one yes. minute, and I don't know if you need any closing right. remarks. So I'm just okay. gonna do it quick. A spiritually supportive school has a school-wide practice of receptive engagement of the awakened brain. Some, one school calls it espacio, making space. It is not just mindfulness. Mindfulness quiets our brain so that we can then cross the threshold into spiritual or augmented awareness. There's a practice of receptive transcendence. There's a language that has to do with the unseen, the knowing of the heart, the deep inner wisdom. There's a language of transcendent awareness. There is someone on staff paid full time to stand up for values. So if a kid's about to be thrown out of school, this person is authorized. In fact, it is hoped that they'll stand up and say, okay, he's made a mistake but isn't this part of his path to learn that we should show up with love? So those are three examples. The Collaborative for Spirituality and Education um, has a whole mapping. And again, it's yours for free through the Awakened School Institute. Stephen, is there any final word that you'd like? I would just say that, 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 that a caring, loving relationship between teachers and students is right at the core of the DNA. Yes. Wouldn't, wouldn't that be correct, Lisa? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So in that history class, Lonnie, what's really important is the quality of the relationship, not talk about spirituality and religion. It's the quality of the relationship. I can appreciate that. And I appreciate that further refinement of the concept. Um, I do appreciate that extra verbiage. And I think that that does definitely help. We have put in a link in chat, just so that you know, Lisa, we put in a link um, to the collaborative. 
uh, and that will be included when we send out the, the video, as I described to you earlier, people will get those links. Um, so thank you so much. It's been a fascinating conversation. Thank you for coming and explaining your research. Um, Stephen, it's been a pleasure getting to know you as well. Thank you so much for supporting the program and for being a good uh, interlocutor here with Lisa. I'm sure she appreciates it as well. 